asking me. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Um, it's quite a, quite a rare event, being out in public, so still getting used to seeing so many people. Can we ask you um, just to be careful and be aware of trying to keep distance so that you know we observe, we observe the rules. Um, I'd just like to say a really big thank you and welcome on behalf of Women Scotland. Um, it's, uh, it's been a, a busy time uh, for us recently. Oh, I should say as well, we've got some hashtags if anyone's wanting to go on Twitter. It's um, Speakers Corner and FWS Edin. Um, any, any others? Okay. Um, we've had a very busy time recently, even though, or, uh, in addition to the global pandemic, um, we've been, as you, most of you will probably be aware, lawyers acting on our behalf this week sent a free action letter to the Scottish Government concerning the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. <laughs> And of course that act um, redefined, for the purposes of that act, the word woman. And the government's position seemingly is that because it's just for this act, it doesn't matter. But we don't really think that's how equality law is supposed to work. And equality law is, as we know, supposedly governed by the Equality Act 2010, which is reserved to Westminster. And our concern is that if the Scottish Government feel they can undermine UK law piecemeal, then the protections within the Equality Act really don't amount to very much at all. So we think it's quite important that we make this stand. Um, we have been really, really touched um, over the last 24 hours by the support that we've had on that. Um, people making donations already, which obviously if we do end up going to judicial review, we will need to raise funds. But um, even more by the messages of support that have gone along with them, and um, many of which really moved me to tears last night, I have to say. It's, it's very hard doing this, and it's very hard putting yourself out there and getting getting the pushback that we do so um, when we read those messages it, it means a great deal so thank you um, and the other thing obviously that is going on is the hate crime bill draft bill which is quite an quite an extraordinary achievement. It has managed to unite people who probably normally won't want to be in the same room as each other. It's united the Catholic Church and the Orange Order, the National <laughs> Secular Society and religious groups. It's united left and right, um, feminists, people who really aren't feminists. Um, it's also had some pretty robust and damaging criticism from both the Law Society and the Scottish Police Federation. And yet, in spite of all this, and in spite of all these very learned people's readings of this act, and what it will entail for free speech in Scotland, the Justice Secretary is still maintaining that the bill says what it doesn't. Uh, we're all able to read the bill. We can see that likely to is not a robust definition. It is incredibly vague and it is very, very troubling. Um, I know people are going to talk later about some of the problems that they've had anyway um, speaking out. Um, but I think that if in future people are concerned that speaking freely will end up it, it land them in court, which is not a an easy process to go through. It's financially draining and it's traumatic for people. And I think that people will be self-censoring. Obviously, um, there was a report today in the Times about um, the pressure that, were put, that was put on um, the uh, on Scottish Affairs for a piece that, by Murray Blackman Mackenzie. Lucy is speaking later, so she will probably have something to say about that. Um, and uh, fortunately, of course, they, they went ahead. But we think that publications and playwrights, comedians, are going to be, have to be increasingly aware and self-centre if this bill comes into force. 
So I'm going to hand over now to Ellis, who is going to talk about what happened at the original Speakers Corner, Speakers Corner event, which is one of the reasons that a lot of this kicked off and that a lot of people know about some of the events that are going on now. So I shall pass you over. Thank you. My name's Venice Allen, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to represent Standing for Women. And with all of you wonderful women of four women in Scott, I am absolutely over the moon. I think this will become an important day, the day that we came here to revive the tradition of free speech at this historic Speaker's Corner. Free speech that is so badly needed here and now, where even our I Heart JK Rowling poster is too political and offensive to be seen. Like so many, I've been banned for life from Twitter, a platform that welcomes paedophiles, misogynists, and racists, but will exile you for calling an adult human male a man. Megan Murphy was deleted for saying, yes, that's him. And I wasn't even given a reason why I had to be excluded from the worldwide platform for debate, networking, and information. As long as the digital public square is owned and moderated by men, women will not have free speech. Nearly three years ago, on September the 13th, 2017, a group of us met at Speaker's Corner in London. We weren't even there to speak, just to pass on the details of the secret venue where we could go to discuss the proposed reform of the Gender Recognition Act. At Speaker's Corner, we were met by trans activists who didn't want to come to our meeting, they just wanted to stop it. As they chanted, no turfs on our turf, and held no debate signs without irony, one of our attendees, Maria McLaughlin, was physically attacked by three men and her camera was smashed to the ground. One of her perpetrators was later convicted, but even though he showed no remorse for his assault and had previously announced his intention to F up some turf that day, he was only given a small fine, and his victim, a five foot four, 60 year old humanist celebrant and cat rescuer, was denied any compensation because she was unable to refer to her assailant in court as a female. Female means of the sex that can bear offspring and produce eggs. It's not a feeling, or a costume, or a mental health diagnosis. A woman this out loud and protect it in law before it becomes to mean a choice of toys, clothes, and the stereotypes of subordination. Female does not mean feminine, but it soon will if we don't stand up and protect it. <laughs> Standing for women are calling for women all around the world to stand up and speak the truth. We are meeting once a month at Speaker's Corner in London. We'll be there on the bank holiday Sunday, 30th of August, and again on September the 13th, three years exactly from our first meeting, and one year on from the death of one of our most inspiring speakers, Madeline Burns. Britain is one of the best places in the world to be a woman, and we are not going to give up our rights, our safety, our privacy, or our freedom. We are going to use our freedom of speech and we are going to take back the public square one corner at a time. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. And my name is Maggie Gibson and it's wonderful to be here today. To begin to the top, right. It's wonderful to be here. And my name's Maggie Gibson, and uh, it's especially, especially wonderful to be here as one of the older women in this struggle. 
When I was first married, I was a main wage earner, and it was through my job that we got our flat to live in. But I was not legally allowed to sign the lease. Think about that. I wasn't even deemed fit to sign a lease for a rental TV. My husband had to do both of those. I was a second class citizen right here in Scotland. But I'd known since school that there was a huge difference between how boys and girls were treated. When I went to secondary school, our whole year was streamed, top pupils in the top class and so on. But they also separated the boys and the girls for form class. The top boys went into the A class. Top girls like me, we were for the B class. In those days, they didn't even try to hide the fact that boys held higher status. And I became very determined that I would fight for women's rights. Women, that word. In the past couple of years, it's got me and other women into so much trouble. I'm a writer. I run writing workshops. I run workshops called Wild Women Writing. I've been running them for 20 years. And these have given me huge insights into women's lives and needs. And more than that, the therapeutic value of all women's spaces. To talk of women's specific trauma, to write from the female body where so much of our life experience is memorized. But by even wanting to discuss and argue for the need and importance of all women's space, it seems I risk transgressing. Oh, Lordy Lord, save us from a transgressive woman. <laughs> I've been on the Scottish writing scene for 35 years. Now as a poet, a children's author, an events organizer, a creative writing tutor. A lot of my involvement has been working with the most marginalized and disadvantaged groups in our society and often in the most challenging settings. Yet younger writers who know next to nothing about my contribution to the Scottish writing scene, and I've worked from Aberdeenshire to Renfrewshire to Glasgow to Stirling to Peebles, across sexualities, classes, ethnicities, religions without fear or favor, have attempted to smear and sully my reputation have indulged in underhand harassment and have contacted writing organizations claiming my presence makes spaces unsafe. Look at me. <laughs> I'm 66 years old and I'm disabled. My presence makes spaces unsafe. These writing organizations listened. They looked at the facts and the facts say those accusations, accusations against me are untrue. But the writing scene that I helped build and make more open and accessible to people from all walks of life feels much less safe for me now. And all this has a chilling effect. It makes it harder not just for me, but for other women, for writers' organizations, for publishers, for events organizers. It even makes it harder for J.K. Rowling. All this is a source of great sadness to me, and yes, anger. But I've been a second-class citizen before in my own country for being born a woman, and I do not give my right up to this public space so easily. And I am here today to point a finger to you. I'm here to point a finger at Nicola Sturgeon. She says that she's a feminist and she is not standing up for many, many women, including women like me. Thank you.
thank you very much to Full Women Scotland for organising this opportunity for women to speak. Yay! My name's Shireen Benjamin, I'm a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm also a materialist feminist. What that means is that I'm on the political left, and I understand that women are oppressed on the basis of biological sex, and protected under the law on that basis. Now, I'm very well accustomed to robust debate, both as a political activist and as an academic. I'm very used to the cut and thrust of evidence and counter evidence, of good faith rebuttals, and the minute, careful construction, sorry, of arguments. But what was new to me when I got involved in the current dispute, which in my own case was only about 18 months ago, sorry about that, I was a late entrant. When I got involved in the current dispute over women's rights, the thing that really perplexed me was this insistence that there should be no debate. The insistence that women have to accept without question a new world order in which we're told that biological sex is no longer significant when we know that it is. The insistence that women's rights should be redesigned and repackaged based not on biological sex, but on a person's inner sense of maleness or femaleness. A sense which I don't have, but which we're supposed to accept should always trump biological sex in law and in policy. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. The insistence that anyone objecting to this new order or even asking questions about its possible consequences for women and girls is motivated by hatred and by transphobic bigotry. The insistence that rational discussion should give way to the endless repetition, and very loud repetition sometimes, of slogans. So I was shocked when I was attacked within my trade union, which is UCU, the college uh, uh, lecturers union, and in my academic work, simply for calling for respectful, evidence-based dialogue on women's sex-based rights. And what Maggie reported about being told she was, too, she was making spaces dangerous for people, those same allegations were leveled, of course, at me. And I've watched in dismay as the intolerant, dogmatic insistence on no debate has taken centre stage in the Labour Party, culminating in the disastrous Labour campaign for trans rights pledge, signed by most of the leadership contenders earlier this year. Shame! That called for materialist feminists like me, and that included women with decades of loyal Labour Party activism under their belts, to be expelled from the party. I'm on the, women, on the working group of the Labour Women's Declaration, and our message to the Labourship is clear. Defend us or expel us. this no debate regime. It has no place in universities or on the political left, which are the very places where we have to be able to critically examine fashionable orthodoxies, no matter how progressive they may appear to be. Right now, it's never been more obvious to me how much we need freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom to criticize and dissent. It's never been more obvious to me how much we need recourse to objective reality and robust evidence to challenge the misinformation and the disinformation that our world is drowning in. So I'm one of countless women who've been targeted for expressing the view that biological sex remains politically relevant. We're not backing down. rights at stake here. I'm sick of reading in the press that this is a fight over trans rights as though it's nothing to do with us. That's wrong and we need to say so. If it's a fight over anything, it's a fight over women's rights, over who should hold them and on what basis. It's a fight to prevent the erasure of women as a sex class. It's our fight and we will be heard. Thank you. Hi, 
this thing on? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along, and thanks to Four Women Scotland for organizing this event. Um, my name's Gillian Phillip. I'm one of those annoying women who used to say, I'm not a feminist. <laughs> it didn't seem necessary, you know, not in this day and age. We're enlightened, I thought. We employ and promote on merit. You know, women's speech is free and carries no terrible consequences. I truly believe that. I mean, okay, some fathers still call parenting uh, babysitting, uh, but things on the whole are much better now. I also thought of myself as a trans ally. Um, and I campaigned for gay rights in the 80s and 90s, and I thought, why not? And then came Twitter. And I actually began to read all the gender critical posts that were on there. And once you see what's happening, you really can't unsee it. Trans people have rights. They should have rights. They have human rights. They do have human rights. It's when extremists demand more rights, rights that overrule the legal sex-based rights of women and girls, that women and girls have the right to say no. We, we fought for the right to say no. And we all know that. I hope we know that, don't we? Why suddenly now are we not allowed to say no? What changed? The capture by this lobby, government bodies, arts organizations, commercial companies, medical, the medical world, I mean, it's been so fast and total, it kind of takes your breath away. Um, sorry, filling around. <laughs> when did children who can't smoke, drink, or get a tattoo become able to ask for untried puberty blockers that could have massive effects on their life and body modification? And when did doctors become too scared to suggest counseling first? When did it become progressive for biological males to demand that lesbians sleep with them? Because it's happening, and you'll hear it on Twitter over and over again, or no one's denying that biological sex exists. You only have to be on Twitter for 10 minutes or any of the social media to know that's not true. People are saying there's no such thing as biological sex, and there is, and that's what our rights are based on. Yeah. When were women's legal, sex-based private spaces, refuges, prisons, changing rooms, when were they thrown open to self-identifying women who might be genuine trans women who need space, yes, but might also be under self-ID, gently intact, fully bearded blokes? They sneaked it under the radar because they knew that women would ask questions, that we'd argue. Women too tend to be argumentative. Hmm. And once we, once we did notice, and once we objected, the strategy had to change. So women who object to this, they have to be shamed, they have to be pilloried, they have to be exiled from polite liberal society, they have to be kicked out of their jobs, preferably left penniless in an ideal world. So what's my story in, uh, uh, after I cottoned on to what was happening? Now, I worked hard for a well-known book packager. I'm a writer, I'm a children's writer. And I worked for a book packager and a far better known publishing company. I wrote, I've kind of lost count, but I've written more than 15 books for them. Tight deadlines, uh, regardless of the needs of my family, of personal tragedies, of the state of my own health. Um, and I wrote them really, really well. I'm just going to say it. Hey! them on unpaid book tours across America for weeks at a time. Now, don't get me wrong, it was, I loved my job and it did not phase me because I thought, you know what, I'm professional, I'm dedicated, I'm loyal. And that professionalism and loyalty, if I'm ever in trouble, that's going to be repaid by my employers. I just know it. They'll never let me down. What was I even thinking? Now, I've got some history of gender criticism on social media, but after what, it was after what happened to Rachel Rooney, who many of you will be familiar with, and to J.K. Rowling. And J.K. Rowling, the abuse and the betrayal of people who were, should have been so loyal to her, yes. 
I was too angry to stay silent anymore because I had been warned off before. So I posted the hashtag on my professional Twitter account, I stand with JK Rowling. later, my publishers came to it and I was fired. No question, no consultation, I was out. The voices of a mob of faceless, nameless trolls outweighed the years of work, skill and effort I'd given to both companies. So do I still think women's position is safe? Do I still think we're heard, respected, treated as equals? Oh no! Do I call myself a feminist today? Hell yes! yes. Our definition, our, our decision to use the word woman 
as the shorthand for people born female. That, that was it. That was the only example. Um, so we think now that same person almost certainly started poking the stirring up provisions in the hate crime bill. And we're looking at provision with criminal sentencing, criminal records, prison sentences, fines. The stakes would have been so much higher had the current legislation been in place at the time all this happened last year. And we think it's really important that stories like ours are told. Yes, we got to speak. Yes, it came out. But only because of the real solid dedication of Scottish Affairs as a journal to stand up to, to what the pressure that, that emerged. So that's why I'm here today. I want to add all of the people in front of you have had personal stories to tell. We're not generalizing, we're not making up fake, this could happen stories. We're all talking from our own direct experience, and I think that's important to uh, take on board. So I'm going to stop now. Thank you for listening. And thank you. As you said, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Here we still are, still fighting. Uh, my name is Victoria Whitworth. I'm a writer and an academic. Um, but today I'm here to channel our great grandmothers. Last week, last week, Nadia Whittam MP, who has snatched the title of Baby of the House from Mary Black, <laughs> said that, quote, the very act of debate is a rollback of equality. And we must not fetishize debate as though debate is itself an innocuous, neutral act. We must not <laughs> fetishize debate. Let's just live with that for a moment. She said, creating a debate about people's fundamental rights or equal status is a hostile act. <laughs> Let's swap out people for women. Creating a debate about women's fundamental rights or equal status is a hostile act. Sound familiar? Yeah. How the hell did we get here? <laughs> How the hell? <laughs> and you know what? We've been here before. In spring 1914, many British art galleries and museums were closed. The National Gallery, Tate, Hampton Court, Windsor Castle, the Tower of London. Why? Not because of a virus because of women, women who were desperate for debate. Because on the 10th of March, 1914, a suffragette called Mary Richardson had gone into the National Gallery in London with a meat cleaver hidden up her sleeve and hacked away at its shiny new purchase of Velasquez's Roque B. Venus. She was sick to death of men valuing women as sexy nudes, but not as human beings. By 1914, women had become very, very angry. Before we ever won the vote, we had to win the right to debate. We started with petitions, 40, 50, 60 years of petitions and we got nowhere. Then at a public meeting, Annie Kenny and Christabel Pankhurst shouted something at Winston Churchill. They shouted, will the liberal government give votes to women? They were thrown out, arrested and imprisoned. And then women were banned from attending public meetings. So they sneaked into the building the day before, or two days before, and they hid in their corsets under the platform, with no food, in the rafters, with no loo, out on the roof for a long winter's night, just to get the chance to debate. The first time Emmeline Pankhurst went to prison, 
It was for trying to enter Parliament to deliver a petition. The second time, it was for issuing a handbill. She was sentenced to three months and forbidden to speak to other prisoners, one of whom was her daughter Christabel. She insisted on speaking and was put in solitary confinement. Fetishized debate! <laughs> Women know where no debate takes us. Damn right we'll fetishize debate. We know what it's worth. take to the stands and actually kind of uh, speak freely without kind of worrying about actually being filmed. So, um, yeah, don't, so if you want to form an orderly line to my left hand side, um, if, uh, please do so. Um, also, if you look to our left hand side, you'll see our I Love J.K. Rowling kind of posters. If you like to Julia says. Take a selfie, put it on Twitter. Yeah. I heart J.K. Rowling. I love J.K. Rowling. The heart doesn't work actually in hashtags, do you? Um, yeah. So after, we're going to see how many people, we can't be here for too much longer because there's this speaker's corner and maybe other people might actually want to speak about other subjects. <laughs> Don't think so. But uh, yeah. So we're going to move shortly to, we're going to turn the cameras off.